Welcome everyone to today's program. My name is Rhonda Hoffman. I'm the genealogy specialist at the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library in the Grosvenor Room. The Grosvenor Room is our special collections department where we have genealogy, local history, maps, music scores, and rare books. Whenever you visit the Grosvenor Room, um, we do have some different policies than the rest of the library. We don't allow food or drinks, and we require you to store any bags, purses, or containers. So I like to just warn people about that so they don't bring anything that they're not comfortable putting in a locker. We are open the same hours as the Central Library. The only time you'd ever have to make an appointment with us if you want, if, is if you wanted to view something from the Rare Book Room, which our online catalog would tell you whether something was in the Rare Book Room or not. So let's get into today's topic, the records of Western New York. First, I'd like to start out by showing you uh, how you can access guides to the Grosvenor Rooms collections. Um, you go to our website, buffalolib.org, and click on special collections, and then you will see a link to guides and publications. And we have guides on numerous topics you can see from adoption to architecture to newspapers to ethnic and immigrant genealogy, church records, military records, just about any kind of genealogical record that you can think of. So that'll tell you what's in our collection and it'll also provide you with leads to other organizations or institutions that might help you with your research. Today's agenda, we're gonna talk about county records specifically for Western New York um, that are created by county departments or institutions. We're gonna talk about the record types and what they might tell you about your ancestor and where to find them. And there will be a handout to this presentation which you will get emailed to you at the end. And I'll also send you a link to this recording. So don't worry too much about taking copious notes. Any of the main topics that I mention, any websites that I might mention will be on your handout. The first record type is probate records. These are one of the earliest types of county records. And they have to do with um, people's estates when they pass away. So you might find documents such as wills, estate inventories, petitions to probate, or a petition to prove a will and guardianship records. A good place to find these are on family search. And you just simply click on the search menu. And then you go to the catalog. And when you search, you want to search for the county of interest. So here I'm, I chose Allegheny County. And I said selected specifically online records. And you just want to scroll down the alphabetical list of categories to probate records. If you scroll down to film and digital notes, then you'll see a listing of the records. These are not keyword searchable yet, but they generally do have online indexes that are digitized that you could browse through page by page. So to the left of the screen, you can see there's a few indexes by different time frames. And then near the top here, you'll see page one of seven. So there's seven pages of results here. So don't think it's just one page. You wanna make sure you flip through all of those pages to see everything that's here. So here is one of the indexes that scanned and put online. This is how most counties are. They'll be roughly in alphabetical order. So you'll see the first two or three letters of the last name, and then they'll hand write in the, the rest of the name. So here we can see we're looking in the ABs. I became interested in the estate for Phoebe Abbott. And then towards the right, you can see the different types of documents that are, that are included. And one of them is a will, and it says volume five, page 64. And then another one, so here's the will, 
And then another one is the box number. And um, that is box number five. So first let's look for the will. And um, the index gave us the volume number five. And you, you can just double check to see if the date range is right for who you were looking for. And here is the will. So this is the will of Phoebe Abbott and she's from Allegheny County. She was 71 years of age when she made her will. And first, um, this is one is a little bit unusual because she's the one with the will and she's giving um, her husband, Salman Abbott, access to her real estate and other property for the term of his natural life. And usually you see that the opposite way around that the husband is giving that to the wife. So this is a little bit unusual. Next, she names her daughters and it's great because it, it names their current name as of when she wrote the will. So her daughters are married and it also names their husband. So for example, she has a daughter, Anna Lown, uh, wife of Samuel B. Lown. And there are a number of daughters listed here. So that's a great connection to make. Then she gives the rest of her property. It names her daughters again, as well as their husbands. And it also names some sons in here. And um, so the next thing I wanna look at is that box. Sometimes this will be called a case file. And um, if you ever go to the surrogate court office to access these records, if they try to talk you out of looking at the stuff in the box, still ask them to get you the box because sometimes there's stuff in there that aren't in the other books that they have. So these are scanned and put online. Sometimes the box or the case files aren't online, but these are online for surrogate county. So it was box number five that I was interested in. And then you just go over to the camera and click on it. You see keys by this one. And in the past, if you saw a key, it always meant that you couldn't access that from home. But I've noticed sometimes it means that you just need to log into your account to access it. If you have to access it from somewhere else other than from home, like a family history center or a family search library affiliate, it will give you a message that tells you that. And if you do get that message, a, the Grosvenor Room is a family search library affiliate. So this is a petition um, for the proof of a will. If the person didn't have a will, you would see something called a petition to probate. And this is where you get a lot of great information as well. This is one of the first documents that I would go to in an estate file. So here it tells us, um, this is again, Phoebe Abbott's file. So Phoebe Abbott of the town of Cuba in Allegheny County. Um, it says where she died, she died in Cuba on the 12th day of July in 1863. So that's great. We have her death date and place, and that's um, a good find because we, for this time frame, New York State did not keep vital records. And then it will list all of those who may have right to inherit from the estate. So we do see all of her children listed here. And in addition to the children's names, we also see that it lists their places of residence. So this is a great way to find people if they moved away and you're not sure where they went to. So her son, William Abbott, was residing in Penfield, Clearfield County in Pennsylvania. So maybe you didn't know where he was. And it does confirm the relationship down at the bottom. Sometimes you'll see the relationship right next to the name, but down at the bottom it says, all of whom are sons and daughters. And we do also get signatures of all of her children too. Another type of record that might be associated with an estate are guardianship 
records. So this is a list of all the different records and family search for Erie County. And you can see the category guardianship. So I selected that. And here's an example record. Um, guardianship records are, like I said, through the surrogate court. And here's what it tells us. So this is it regarding Susan M. Williams. And um, it is a petition of Timothy Huff, who is the great uncle of Susan M., the daughter of Amanda Williams, and that the petitioner lives in Hamburg, and that Susan M. is nine years old last January, that no guardian has been appointed for the minor. And the guardian in this case is not like someone who is going to take them in and care for them. It's a guardian for this child's interest in her mother's estate. It says that the mother of said minor is dead and that the child is in the custody of one John McCain of the town of Evans in that county. So we do see where she winds up with a John McCain. That it is desirable that a guardian should be appointed for the minor and that Nathan Williams of the town of Hamburg is the grandfather of the minor and the nearest relative. And it says that she is illegitimate and the respected father of said minor is also deceased. So you can see what great information you might find in those guardianship records. Miscellaneous records is another uh, record type through the county. These are one of my favorite records. Um, all of the New York State County governments will have a collection of these. And um, a lot of records that they include between late 1800s to early 1900s um, include things like adoptions, military discharge papers, lease agreements, indentures, powers of attorney, judgments, registration of organizations like churches or different societies, rights of way, water privileges, uh, different government, like county government appointments, especially deputy sheriffs. The library has Erie and Cattaraugus County on microfilm and Family Search has a number of these online. So these, I mean, these could just almost include anything. And something that you see frequently are military discharge papers. Um, here's a summary of what we see in this example. Um, Charles Horth was a private in the 72 Regiment Company H in the New York State Volunteers under John S. Mann. He enlisted on the 17th of October in 1861 for three years, and he was discharged on October 30th, 1864 at a camp near Peter, Petersburg, Virginia, due to his term had expired, and it, they did not object to his reenlistment, so he must have been an okay soldier. He was born in New Albion, New York. He was 24 years old at the time of his discharge. He was a farmer. And it gives a physical description, five foot eight, light complexion, hazel eyes, and light brown hair. You may also find apprenticeship or indenture agreements in these records. This is an example from Erie County in 1815. And it says this indenture made on the 26th day of December, 1815, William Gable, son of Joseph Gable, aged 10 years, four months and 13 days, by and with the consent of the said Joseph Gable, his father and his own free will have bound himself an apprentice to Timothy McEwen of Buffalo Shoemaker to dwell and continue to serve until the apprentice I'm sorry, until William Gable is 21 years old, which will be on the 15th day of August, 1826. And he agrees to faithfully serve and obey, keep his secrets, his lawful commands he has to follow. Um, he will not hurt his master or suffer it to be done unto others. He shall not embezzle or waste at cards, dice, or any other unlawful gains. He shall not play taverns, alehouses, or tippling houses he shall not frequent, fornication he shall not commit, matrimony he shall not contract. From the service of his said master he shall not at any time depart or absent himself 
without the master, um, but in all things as good and faithful apprentice shall and will demean himself towards his said master during the term. And then the master in return um, will teach and instruct or cause to be well and sufficiently taught, will also find and allow unto the said apprentice meat, drink, washing, lodging, and apparel, both woolen and linen, and all other necessaries, fit and convenient for such apprentice. Send the apprentice to good English school for the period of one year and a half in order that the apprentice shall be instructed to read, write, and cipher, and at the end of the term shall give on to the said apprentice one good new suit of clothes fit for holy days and two good suits for a shoemaker and also one new Bible. They always get a Bible all the time. They usually went out all of these that I've looked at. They often get different suits of clothes. Sometimes they do get money as well. You can find early adoption records before adoption records were closed in the 1930s. You might find the adoption records and miscellaneous records. First, I'm just going to scroll through some images just to show you how long these documents might be. And here's a summary. So the child up for adoption is Ada Valley, who it says she's under 12 years old. And the couple wanting to adopt are Roland Kingsley and his wife, Margaret of Sardinia. And the birth mother is Rose Valley of Buffalo, who has custody of Ada. And the father, August Valley, abandoned and refuses to support Ada and Rosa, considered unfit with a drinking habit. And then the Kingsley, Ada, and Rosa were interviewed by the judge, and they're all deemed fit and in agreement to the adoption. You can often find miscellaneous records in the family search uh, database. So again, search for the county of interest. Usually these are under the court records category. So there you can see for Erie County, they have miscellaneous records from 1808 to 1907. And here's a listing of, of all the different groupings, the different volumes. Sometimes you'll see indexes listed here, or sometimes the indexes are just in the front of the book. For Erie County, they're in the front of the book. So here's an example for an adoption. If you were looking for an adoption, you could look under the child uh, the child who's being adopted's name. I've also seen that usually the people adopting the child are indexed in here as well. You can see that it lists all the different types of actions. So it's got the name and then what action is being taken. For um, Niagara County, I noticed I had a hard time finding the records. So another way to search, if for some reason you don't see miscellaneous records as a category, you could go into the keyword field instead of the place field and put in the county name and the word miscellaneous. And I found for some reason Family Search grouped the Niagara counties with the land records. Another document of, uh, from the county are deeds. So these are land records. We're all pretty yeah. familiar with these. Um, you can buy and sell real estate um, with these documents. They will usually list the wife's name. If you see cheap sales, they're often family members. Um, there, there are records for grantors and grantees when you're looking at the indexes. So the grantor is the person selling the land and the grantee is the one who's, who bought the land. Usually these will list neighbors' names, uh, especially in the description of the property. So these will always describe the property that's being bought and it'll tell the boundaries like who was next door. Who, um, and these are found at county clerk's offices. So here, if we look at the top, it tells the date and it tells the two parties who are um, buying and selling the property. So Harriet each 
uh, E. Hedges of the town of Bennington in Wyoming County, New York, is the grantor. She's selling the land. And Andrew J. Foster of Pittsfield, Warren County, Pennsylvania, is the one who's buying the land. You can see that he's buying it for $1, so that it might be a family relationship or some other type of relationship between these two parties. What's great is that um, we can see that he lives out of the area. So you might, in these, when, when your person first moves to an area, he might be buying the land from another location. So you could, you could track him you know, backwards this way. And down at the bottom, it says that together the farm now and heretofore occupied by the widow of um, N.P. Hedges. So, um, so now, now we know um, that N.P. Hedges is also associated with this property. Um, I'm guessing Harriet is probably the widow of um, N.P. Hedges, but she might not be. It could be someone else. You can find these on Family Search as well. There is a database for New York land records. And you, so you can keyword search across these. I found that everything's not done yet. I don't have a lot of luck finding Erie County people in here. So I don't think they've completed Erie County. Um, it says that the collection includes all counties except for Franklin, Nassau, and Queens. Um, but I don't think everything is indexed yet. Naturalization records. Um, this is the process of becoming a US citizen. From 1906 to the present, there are very detailed records. You could have been naturalized at multiple courts, but many people were naturalized through a county court. These are a great way to learn where your immigrant ancestor was born. There is a database on family search for New York County naturalizations. So you could keyword search. Um, I will tell you that Erie County is not included in this particular database. So here we're searching for Herbert Gracie, um, who was of Canada, and I found his record. There might be a couple of different types of documents. One is the declaration of intention. So this is the first step in the process. So you're saying that you want to become a citizen of the US. Usually you would have had to be a resident in the country for a while before you did this. Oftentimes it's from two to five years. You should know too that many immigrants filed the declaration of intent but never completed the naturalization process. So even if you think your ancestor didn't naturalize, have a look to see if they started the process but didn't complete it. And some people just filed the declaration of intent because they may have, it may have been a requirement to buy property. So here's the petition for naturalization, which is the next step in the process. And um, I just wanted you to see what it looked like. And now I'll show you a summary. So after filing the declaration of intent, usually they had to wait a few years before they filed their petition for citizenship. And this is the information that we gain from both of these documents. So Herbert John Gracie was residing in Medina, New York. He was a farmer. He was born March 1st, 1884 in Moulton, Canada. And he emigrated on the 6th of November, 1908 through Fort Erie via the Grand Trunk Railway. He was married to Mabel, who was born at Camden, Canada, and they have one child, Dorothy, born the 9th of July, 1914 in Medina. And then it lists the witnesses, their occupation, and their town of residence. And often those witnesses have some kind of um, family connection to the person being naturalized, but not necessarily. Early naturalizations before 1906 may not have as detailed 
information in them, but sometimes you can see good information. Um, so this is an example from Lockport, New York, where um, this gentleman, it states he's from Dumfrieshire in Scotland. That's about all it contains, but we do have a location where he's from here. County clerk registers are a great place to look when you're visiting the county clerk's office. These are usually only available in the county clerk's offices and they index different records like civil lawsuits, divorce records, uh, commitments to mental health institutions, uh, competency trials. For divorce records, there's a hundred year waiting period before we can have access to these for genealogical research. And if it involved things like commitments to institution, they may be sealed records that you can't get access to. Divorce records were first kept at the Chancery Court. They could grant divorces for adultery and also for separations and annulments from 1787 to 1847. And that court no longer exists. From 1847 forward, the New York Supreme Court, and every county has one, was uh, the court that granted divorces. Um, from until 1967, the only grounds for divorce was adultery. So divorces were difficult to get. Um, divorces for other reasons required an act of state legislature, which was very rare for that to happen. Because the laws were strict, the couple may have sought a divorce from another state or country, or the couples may have separated without legal proceedings. Um, I've got two different family members that did this. They just separated from their spouse. And one of them actually got remarried. Um, his, the person that he married did not know he used to be married and was never divorced before he married her. So here's some example content that you might see in early divorce records. I found one in 1876 in Chautauqua County. So the husband wanted a divorce from the wife due to her adulterous behavior. The couple first lived and got married in Chautauqua County. Then they moved to Iowa and ran a boarding house. The husband caught the wife with another man at the boarding house. And then the husband moved back to Chautauqua County. The couple was married on July 3rd, 1858. It gave the maiden name of the wife. It said also in 1862, the wife had an affair with a Chautauqua County man and the man was named in this uh, record. There was an affidavit from a female neighbor who discovered the affair. The wife stayed in Northwood Worth County, Iowa and did not return to Chautauqua County by the time of the divorce proceedings. And the couple had one daughter who was unnamed, but it did state that she was 18 at the time of the divorce and living with an aunt and that she was a teacher. The outcome of the case was that the wife did not respond to the complaint of the husband and the husband was granted a divorce the husband was allowed to remarry and the wife was ordered to not remarry until the former husband passed away. Often you'll see those stipulations with these early divorces. Someone could remarry and the other one couldn't. Name changes you can find indexed in those county clerk registers. You can also find name changes in miscellaneous records, which I talked about earlier in the presentation. So um, some of you that have taken my other classes might know my saga of my maiden name and my, my maiden name is Hoffman, but I think it might supposed to be Polson because the family went by both names and I'm trying to prove what is what. And I got this name change document but I don't know, I'd be curious at the end of the presentation if you, if you think that this answers my question or not. I think it kind of doesn't answer my question. But so here's the name change document from Chautauqua County. This is my grandfather, Felix Raymond Polson and Gertrude Polson, his wife. 
Um, it says the petitioners are upwards of the age of 35 years and reside at 23 North Jerboa Street in Dunkirk and that they have resided for a period of six months before making this application, that they wish to desire another name than now held by them, and that the name which they propose to assume is Felix Raymond Hoffman and Gertrude Hoffman. That the grounds for this application for such change are as follows. By reason of the fact that they have always been known by the surname Hoffman, and that their records conflict with the use of that name, and for the additional reason they wish to Americanize the pronunciation and spelling of the name Polson and to change it to Hoffman. They also wish to avoid a confusion in records, part of which are in the name Polson and part of which are in the name Hoffman, and that is very true. It's mind boggling to see how many times they've used the different names that the petitioners are married and have one child, Norman Felix Polson, born September 5th, 1931 in Dunkirk, that they are US citizens, that Felix was born on April 11th, 1897, and his father is Stephen Polson, naturalized as Stephen Hoffman, and that his mother is Agnes Polson, or through naturalization of her husband, Agnes Hoffman that your petitioner Gertrude Polson was born on the 6th day of November, 1904, and her father was Joseph A. Golubsky, and her mother was Angeline Golubsky, that there's no judgments or anything against these people, so they're not trying to change their name to evade any kind of debt or something like that. Um, let's see. And then, um, they pray and order to assume the names of Felix Raymond Hoffman and Gertrude Hoffman in place of their current names, and also that their child, Norman, may be permitted to assume the surname of Hoffman as well. So I don't know. I'm not sure. It, it seems implied that the original name was Polson, but I'm not sure if it you know, outright states that or not in these documents. Vital records are usually kept at the town level in New York State, but for a certain time frame, mainly from around 1907, 1908 to 1935, uh, these were also supposed to be filed with the county. Um, for Erie County, they filed them for a wider time frame than most of the other counties. So the county has them from 1877 to 1935. And the Western New York Genealogical Society has these as part of their collection in the Grosvenor Room. And um, of course, these have great genealogical content. You'll see the two um, people's names who are getting married. You'll see their addresses, how old they were, their occupation, their place of birth, um, their parents' names, and often their parents' place of birth. You can also see to the right, it tells who married them. It says he's a Roman Catholic priest. It often doesn't list the specific church, but with the name of the priest, you could look him up in a directory and then see what church he's associated with. A lot of these county marriage records for New York are online on Ancestry. So if you go to Ancestry and go to all categories and then choose New York, if you look under the records unique to New York, you will see New York County marriages, um, 1907 to 1936. You may find a few early records in the 1840. They, uh, the state started to try to keep vital records, but people weren't compliant for the most part. So there are very few of those. When you open up this data set, you wanna make sure you go to browse this collection to the right to see what counties are included because all counties are not in here. For example, Erie County is not in here. Albany County is not in here. So certain, counties are, are not in this data set, but most Western New York counties are. So you can keyword search 
Here I searched for Earl Horace Stevens for Chautauqua County. And we see over to the right that he was married in 1914 to Viola Blanche Wilkins. And if you wanted to view the record itself, you can click the image right here. It looks very similar to what the earlier record that I showed you. Another trick is that you can also search this data set by parents' names. So if you're not sure of all of the children a couple had, and you think the children would be of an age that they may have been married for this date range, like 1907 to 1935, you could search for the parents' names. And here I searched for Joseph Golubsky and Angeline Miga, and I came up with four children that are boxed off to the right here. Who are their children? Medical examiner records. We have, uh, the library has Erie County Med medical examiner records from October 1878 through June of 1902, available in the Grosvenor Room um, as part of the Western New York Genealogical Society's collection. So these are coroner reports, autopsy reports. Um, Information included varies from time period to time period, but you'll likely find the person's name and age, place of birth, marital status, place of residence, sometimes how long resided in the city, usually their occupation, sometimes their place of employment, the date and time of death, the place of death, the cause and circumstances of death, the place of burial, a physical description, Sometimes it will list personal belongings with the person who was deceased at their time of death. You might see the undertaker listed and you'll see the physician or medical examiner's name. Keep in mind that autopsies were not performed on everyone. Usually it was just in the cases of unexpected or unattended deaths. So someone has an accident um, it would include things like homicides or suicides, or just, you know, if someone was young and healthy and they just died suddenly, that might be looked into. Here's an example. So probably a lot of you know, um, in Buffalo, President William McKinley was shot at the Pan American Exposition that was held here. And um, he died a few year, a few days after he was shot here in Buffalo. And this is his autopsy report. It says he's 58 years, seven months and 15 days. He's married. He was born in Niles, Ohio. It tells his occupation as the president. Um, he was in the city for eight days and he was at an address on Delaware Avenue and he died at that address. And it gives the um, date and time and that his cause of death was gangrene of both walls of his stomach and pancreas following a gunshot wound. Oftentimes, um, you'll see on the County Medical Examiner Records website who they will allow access to medical examiner records. So if you're looking for something that's not available elsewhere, you can see what relationships are allowed and it'll go um, relationship by relationship. So like a spouse can always um, get access. A child can unless parental rights were terminated via adoption. And then a grandchild could if the child or parent um, who did the decedent um, grandchild have in common is deceased. And it goes down from there. Oftentimes it's if this person is deceased, then this person can get it. And then there'll usually be some kind of form that you have to fill out to prove your relationship to that person. Counties were in charge of poorhouses. All of the counties across New York State at one time had a poorhouse, sometimes called an almshouse. And these were places where the poor might go to live if they were homeless or couldn't care for themselves. Um, sometimes temporary assistance might be given out through the superintendent of, of the poor. Maybe they could still live at home, but they might need a monetary distribution. Um, but usually um, you might find records pertaining to those lived in the home. And um, a lot of people also, if they couldn't afford medical care, they would go to a poorhouse for medical care as well. 
So these you might find with a county historian's office or libraries. Um, you wanna research the history of the poorhouse. If it transitions to a different institution, the current institution might have the records that you're looking for if they're not found elsewhere. The library does have Erie County Poorhouse records from 1829 to 1952 in the Grosvenor Room. The collection is not complete. There are gaps in the collection. There are different record types. Um, there are a lot of intake registers. So who's coming into the home? Why are they in the home? Uh, when they left the home? Um, there are some hospital registers. There are some death registers. Those are digitized and put on the library's website for free. You don't need a library card or anything. You can just go to our website and click on research and resources and click on digital collections. And you'll see where you can browse by categories. There's a category called collections about Western New York. And then you'll see the Erie County Poorhouse Ledgers. There is a nice finding aid. Once you open up that record set, you'll see a link to a finding aid where you can learn about the history of the poorhouse, terms of use of the collection, what the records include, what exactly we have, any other re poorhouse related materials that we have in our collection or that other institutions might have. So here's a listing of some of the registers. There are 15 volumes. All of them have been digitized. One of the most interesting volumes is the children's register. It's a register of children bound out. If children were placed in a poorhouse, they would bind them out to different families. So they might go and work for a different family or um, a family might take them in as a sort of trial adoption period. Even babies might be bound out. These records are in the 1860s. Um, so you can see the names of the children and their ages. And then you can see um, if they were taken out, um, who they went with. So a lot of times you will see relatives. You can see a number of people went with their mother or father, um, but then there's an example where someone went out with a gentleman named Nick Fallick. It tells where he lived, East Eden, New York, and he was taken out March 13th of 1867. And it doesn't say he's returned. Um, it could be that he stayed with this person for until he was an adult, or it, could be that something else happened. Down at the bottom, we see Azara Brooks took out a child. He was from Newstead. And it says that he took him out in November and then he brought him back about a week later in December. This is the earliest, uh, one of the earlier registers we have. It's also another children's register from 1841 into 1852. You can see that there is some damage to some of these records, but they're generally legible. So here's some examples. Um, these are children were not necessarily bound out, uh, but it does tell their names, their ages, um, why they were in the home. So one example, it says mother died insane from loss of two boys. Towards the bottom, mother died of cholera and father in Ohio at work. So like these particular records were taken um, during a cholera epidemic that happened in Buffalo. There were several epidemics. To the right, it tells when they left the home and with whom. If someone passes away, it would list that. You can see a couple of the children died. Um, you can see in most of the children were taken out by family members. So it says to mother, to brother, to parents. Uh, one of the children, it says absconded. So they just left the home, sort of escaped. This is a um, intake register. And this is the earliest volume that we have. It starts in, on January 8th, 1829. So it lists the individuals and their ages. 
where um, they were born. So you can see a number of different cities in New York State. So that's very helpful genealogically. Um, and it tells when they were committed to the home. So it gives the date and then when they were discharged. If someone passed away again, that would be noted usually with their death date. This is a more recent register um, from the early 1900s, another intake register. And this one, again, they're listing that great information of where they were born. And they, there are a lot of specific towns in New York. It also lists the person's age and it either lists the year of birth or some of them it gives an exact birth date. So that's very helpful. Um, there's two sides to this on the other side of the record. It tells when they were committed um, of what town are they from and it often gives a full address. Sometimes it will give the cause of why they're in the home, for example, that person at top, it says she was partly blind. If someone was transferred to the hospital, it gives the date they were transferred. So there were multiple buildings on the Erie County Poorhouse campus at this time. And, you know, one of them was the poorhouse where people lived. And then another one was a hospital. And then it tells when people were discharged. This is a death register. So you can see the names, their ages, where they were born, their occupation, their date of death, their date of burial. It gives the cemetery names. On the other side, it says the cause of death. Um, to the far right, it tells um, the undertaker. And in the middle, um, they made some notes to insurance companies there. This is a consent to autopsy. And these are great because usually it was a family member who had to give um, consent. So here we see Arazia Girochi, the nearest living relative of, Mar of Maria Sedora, alias Domenica Girochi, who is the deceased. And then it has Arazia's uh, signature there. And it says that she's the sister of Maria Sedora. The last record type I'll talk about are um, lists of registered voters. We have these at the library for Erie County from 1926 to 1971. These are, you can see these are official printed lists, not any, there are no handwritten lists that we have. And usually they're in order by town and then within the town, either by address or a district. And, um, it might give a street number. If not, they're often in alphabetical order by name. Um, there are some gaps, a few gaps in the records, but we have most of the years. Um, and these are great city directory substitutes. So a lot of the smaller towns didn't have their own directories until the 1950s, 60s, or even later. So if you're looking to locate your ancestor and they were registered voters, this is a way to do that by looking through these records. So where you find county records, I gave you a lot of different places to look, but you know, obviously the county clerk's office, county historian's offices, um, really old records, you might find them sometimes. The county might have deposited things into different libraries and archives. Um, it could be public libraries, university, genealogical societies, museums, historical societies. And the main two places to look online are FamilySearch and Ancestry.com. I'd also like to give a plug for the Western New York Genealogical Society. Their collection is in the Grosvenor Room. So some of the records I mentioned are, that I showed you are from their collection. Um, and they have a publication. They used to publish something called the journal that transcribed many different records for the Western New York area. So that's another resource to look for transcribed records. And that's everything I had for you today. Um, 
again, I will email you a copy of the handout and I'll email you the, a link to the recording. And my email is there, but you'll, you'll get an email from me. So you'll have my email. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to email me after this presentation. I'm going to go ahead.